Um, welcome to this panel on entrepreneurship development across Asia. I'm Renita Calhorn, the moderator, and I'll introduce our panelists in a moment, but I'd like to start by giving some context for our discussion today. So to build a startup and VC ecosystem where entrepreneurship is accessible and can flourish takes decades. We have to remember that Silicon Valley started back in the 1940s. So there have always been great entrepreneurs coming out of Asia, building companies like Lenovo, Sony, uh, SoftBank, just to name a few. But still in many Asian cultures, entrepreneurship as a career option has been seen as risky and going against tradition. Um, still, that, that cultural mindset is changing. And there's this wave of entrepreneurial talent on the rise in Asia Pacific. And the region is home to many of the most innovative markets in the world, including three of the global top 10, South Korea, Singapore, and Japan, with the emerging markets uh, like Indonesia rising quickly. So in fact, Asia Pacific has all the ingredients to make it a fertile breeding ground for startups and innovation, fast economic growth, expanding middle markets, and middle-income populations and growing number of small and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, in addition to that, with all this exposure to global influences, new generations are more enthusiastic about entrepreneurship. So as an executive leadership coach, I work with tech founders and their teams to expand their agility and adaptability so they can respond quickly to take advantage of change and volatility. And I think we all know that that's where the greatest opportunity lies. So our panel today is situated all across the Asian region. And my goal is to draw out the key trends and stories of entrepreneurship that they're seeing. And I hope this will do two things, at least two things. One, help you develop a well-rounded perspective of the Asia Pacific region, entrepreneurship. And two, identify where there might be opportunities for your organization or company. So let's dive into the conversation. I'm going to introduce each panelist and invite them to take three or four minutes to present their perspective, and then we'll open it up for some back and forth. And if we have time, we'll, we'll do some Q&A at the end. So I'd like to start with you, Shun. Prior to joining White Star Capital as a venture partner in 2017, Shun Nagao was executive director of the Silicon Valley Japan platform where he connected Japanese blue chip companies to their Silicon Valley counterparts. Um, like uh, he's worked in investment banking at Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs, as well as the World Economic Forum. And he's currently managing also the Japan operations of Bauer Group Asia, a strategic advisory company with Fortune 500 clients. And on top of that, he's an associate professor of entrepreneurship at Shizenkam University. So, Shun, you've been working in these uh, diverse roles that give you a, a very well-rounded perspective, it seems, uh, as a VC, lobbyist for Fortune 500 companies, and a professor of entrepreneurship. So I'm curious, what are the most notable trends that you've been seeing, and could you share a success story that maybe represents the possibilities for entrepreneurship in Japan? Sure. Yes. Um, hello, everyone. Pleasure to be uh, on this panel. And Renita, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so I'll just start by sharing uh, some of, uh, to build up on uh, what you mentioned about uh, kind of large economies being in this region. Uh, I think specifically at White Star, I cover uh, Japan and uh, South Korea. And so some observations there in the markets. Um, and uh, as you mentioned, traditionally, uh, these two kind of economies uh, have seen a lot of uh, conglomerates um, pull uh, or lead the economy. Uh, and there were some names that you mentioned there. And it's certainly still true. Um, but I think uh, if we look at, let's say, the venture capital funding amount in the recent years, it's been on a rising trend uh, in both countries. Uh, and uh, I think this year in Japan will probably tip uh, six billion U.S. dollars. Uh, and it's up from, uh, we kind of saw a little uh, dent uh, in 2020 because of COVID, uh, but it's been on a rising trend. Um, Korea probably will be somewhere in between uh, more than 4 billion, probably more on uh, a little bit over 5 billion this year. 
Uh, and also there's another trend that we're seeing that we've seen in other uh, mature uh, startup ecosystems where the deal uh, size per deal actually goes up uh, and the overall deal number kind of plateaus. And so there's kind of a, a, um, a move to quality. And so rather mm -hmm. than funding everything, mm -hmm. there's actually a tip off of the actual uh, absolute number of deals done. But actually the funding amount goes up which means that the average deal size is going up. And we've, seeing, we've been seeing this uh, in both countries. Um, one of uh, the kind of promising signs that, uh, signs that I see, especially in Japan and also Korea, is that the traditional kind of uh, career path is changing. So before it was really going into Sony, it was going to Panasonic, it was going for LG Electronics, Hyundai. Uh, but then uh, a lot of the talent are now actually choosing startup as their first career. So I would, I would say they're ditching the playbook uh, and actually aspiring for a startup um, career. And then before, um, you know, you're, you're a, a startup entrepreneur's parents uh, or their significant other might have been the one saying, no, don't take risks. But there's more of an acceptance uh, of that career path, which is really kind of pushing this trend. Uh, and uh, the other uh, kind of last point before I pause uh, would be uh, foreign capital as well. And so in Japan, uh, for a long time, uh, the U.S. venture capital uh, funds uh, or even European ones uh, kind of overlooked uh, Japan. Mm -hmm. And they were going into China. They were going into India uh, as, well, as well as Southeast Asia uh, because there was the growth. Uh, but then in uh, the last, I would say, 18 months, uh, we've, been, we've seen Sequoia. Uh, deploy capital. We've seen Founders Fund uh, actually fund uh, early stage Japanese deals. We've also seen PayPal uh, buy a uh, BNPL deal uh, in Japan, uh, valued at over $3 billion. Uh, and so we've been seeing these uh, activities uh, not just happen domestically, uh, but also cross-border happening in, in Japan and obviously in Korea as well, kind of increasing, uh, which kind of gives me uh, a lot of uh, optimism. So I'll pause here. That's a very optimistic perspective. That's, that's exciting. Thank you. Um, Jane, thank you for, for joining us. Um, just for, for the people listening in, our scheduled panelist, Stephen Phillips, had a last minute emergency. And so standing in for him is his colleague, Jane Chan. Um, Jane is head of Start Me Up HK at Invest HK the government department responsible for attracting and retaining foreign uh, direct investment into Hong Kong. And prior to joining Invest HK, Jane was executive director at the HK chapter of Thai, a global not nonprofit network focusing on fostering entrepreneurship um, in the markets in which they operate. And then previous to that, she had management roles at digital agencies, e-business in, uh, integrators, and uh, startup incubators. So Jane, um, Start Me Up HK's Invest HK's initiative aimed at helping founders of innovative and scalable startups uh, and overseas communities as well to set up to expand in Hong Kong. Can you give us a snapshot of what you see happening? For example, some of the, the key trends, uh, what initiatives are you putting in place and, and also a success story that might represent what your, your, your goals are and what you're looking to achieve. Sure, and, and thank you so much, Renita, and uh, for, for you know the introduction. And it's a real pleasure to be here among such distinguished speakers. Actually, um, in terms of um, uh, the startup ecosystem, maybe I could just say a little bit more about what's happening here in Hong Kong. So my role specifically is to support startups, um, scale ups usually um, from overseas to actually establish in Hong Kong. And in addition to that, my two other hats that I wear is also to promote Hong Kong internationally as a tech hub. So prior to travel restrictions and things, you know, I used to, to go to a lot of different places and I used to meet with different groups of startups, whether we're talking about, you know, maybe a university programs or um, incubators, accelerators, or speaking at events like this, exhibiting um, at, you know, overseas events, basically just to give everyone um, overseas who may not be you know, clear on the kind of opportunities that are, they are on the ground here in Hong Kong and through Hong Kong to other places um, such as the, the Greater Bay Area. Um, this is an area, southern China, um, 
you know, nine different cities plus Hong Kong, Macau mm -hmm. collectively um, developed as the Greater Bay Area. And I'll probably go into that a little bit later. Um, but yeah, it's just to give that information out there and to tell people about these opportunities. And finally, the, the third hat that I wear is to also build the ecosystem on the ground. So in terms of the kind of things that we're seeing, um, we've been tracking the development of the startup ecosystem for the past seven years, actually, through you know, a startup survey that we've been doing with all the accelerators, co-work spaces, and uh, incubators. And over those years, we've, we've seen tremendous growth. We've just released the results of this year's um, startup survey and residing at those different um, locations, those hubs, we've got over 3,700 startups um, mm -hmm. You know, across those different kind of areas. Now that actually only captures the ones that are residing in those locations, which means that you know the ones that are maybe too large have their own offices. It's not captured, so we do expect that actual number to be higher. Um, but one thing I'd like to highlight about our ecosystem, which is slightly different, I think, from a lot of ecosystems within Asia and even globally is how international our startup ecosystem is. So about a third of our founders are from outside of Hong Kong, mm. or, they're, they're, you know, a, a percentage of that is a, is a returnee, something like 7% of those founders are returnees, but oftentimes they've spent many, many years away from Hong Kong. They see the opportunities that they're coming back. But when you've got a third of, of your founders from outside, you know, they come into you know, the, the ecosystem here with a different way of resolving problems, with a different way of actually, um, you know, different kind of experiences. So when you have that kind of outlook and you marry that with local entrepreneurs, local founders, with their language capabilities, their very strong kind of professional background, I think you, you get very strong startups which is why we've got about 11 unicorns here in Hong Kong. We've mm -hmm. had one go public earlier on this year. We've got another two or three in the wings to go public across different places. So I think it's, um, you know, it's, a, it's a very high per capita unicorn creation considering we're a population of 7.4 million people. So you know, I just think there are very solid opportunities there and I look forward to sharing more of that later on. Cool, thank you. Yeah, it sounds like diversity is one of the distinctive uh, qualities of the ecosystem in Hong Kong. Absolutely, absolutely. It, it really does make a big difference, I think. Yeah, there's opportunities for cross-pollination. Well, we'll definitely circle back to that. Um, let's um, move to Sinartis. Sinartis Sosrojojo is an entrepreneur and consultant with 20 years of diverse experience in business development, media, brand building, community engagement, entrepreneurship, and mobile technology. He began his business career founding a communications agency, working with multinational clients in energy, consumer goods, pharmaceuticals, and property. And in 2009, uh, Sinartis founded PT Gilcor, which he led through an acquisition to become the leading loyalty and engagement systems provider for malls in Indonesia. So Sinartis, you're in Indonesia. There's a, a strong sense of collectivism that we've talked about. Um, how does this influence entrepreneurship, which is, you know, kind of seen as being very independent and going against connection? And how does that play into your experience building companies and maybe specifically your approach to hiring ta talent, for example? Well, thank you, Renita, for the introduction. And I'm glad to be here with all of you guys. Um, uh, in terms of what I do uh, uh, in building team building aspect of it, uh, the collectivism in Indonesia, you know, there's a lot of plus into that. Uh, us as a nation, and I think in a lot of the neighboring countries also have the same similarity that, you know, we, we work well in groups and there's tend to be less individualism in, you know, in, in the way that we work. So we try to leverage that in terms of when we hire and a lot of the things that I'm you know, helping now advising uh, the startups and advising you know, some of the, uh, the people who are going in is that making sure uh, the first hires are always you know, hopefully the right hires. Just because once you have enough collectivism of a group uh, that is usually well-balanced through cross-functionally, check you know, through cross-functionally, 
it makes your team a lot more nimble. And it really, what I saw, you know, what I've seen so far in the last, you know, 10 years or so is just there's a drastic uh, cut in people leaving. Uh, and I mean, we all know that for a lot of the bigger startups who have a lot of the bigger budgets, you know, it's not a problem for them to ramp up once they've, you know, get the investment in. And that is also a source of issue usually when you're trying to uh, get the corporate uh, culture, you know, strengthened within a company. But when you are a medium to smaller startups and you're trying, you know, to ramp up, you really got to be more careful because if through the collectivism uh, hiring is not done properly, mm. um, things can go south really, really quickly. And, and it's, a, it's a lot easier, I think, when you're in a bigger company because a lot of those issues are usually masked by the numbers. Uh, you know, we, you know, in, we, we all know when we have a large, you know, management meeting, things, you know, things get you know, a little bit camouflage, you know, easier, I think. But mm -hmm. when you're in a smaller outfit, it just becomes more and more crucial for you to have the right hire. So what we try to do and what I've implemented in a lot of the organizations that I've been involved in is a lot of the cross-functional hiring that I've learned, you know, from some of my old matters and how they actually uh, work really well within at least our culture. And, and that allows us to have a really, really low, uh, you know, rate of people leaving the companies. Mm -hmm. So, and that's, that's something that I try to make sure because at the end, uh, you know, when we trying to talk about investment, we are really thinking about sustainability. You know, what happens with the firm, with the company, once, let's say, you know, the major investors, you know, exit, you know, there's a new, you know, people coming in. And I'm always been a firm believer that you know, I mean it's 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 all good you know to to make a profit, but at the end of the day, if you can make a company sustainable, that, you know if you really believe what the company is doing, and you really want it to make sustainable, you really have to focus on the people. Mm. Wow. Um, I mean, I think any company listening to this, they all want to have that low turnover and high retention, right? <laughs> so it sounds like yeah. there's there's a secret there that uh, they could be learning from. Thank you. Um, Eliezer, Eliezer Manor, uh, based in Israel, is involved in every aspect of the tech ecosystem through his company, Sharat Enterprises, as a founder, supporting entrepreneurs and developing different aspects of venture capital. He's also involved in an open innovation incubator program together with local governments and large companies from China to work with Israeli companies to establish operations for business development in China and in the Chinese and worldwide markets. So Eliezer, Israel, I think we all know, is known as the startup nation because of the disproportionate number of startups it produces and, and the unique combination of factors that create such a fertile environment for entrepreneurship. And according to my research in 2020, startups raised almost $10 billion which is kind of amazing considering how, how small Israel is. So I'm curious, could you share with us what it, what it takes in your opinion to be a successful startup and in particular what it takes to be successful entering the Asian markets? Thank you very much, Renita, for the introduction. Uh, you're right, Israel is today is the paradise of high-tech entrepreneurship. It is number one in startups are capital, in investments per capita and in unicorns per capita. I will not present you an example of an Israeli success story because I don't believe in the importance, the impact and the efficiency of telling sto success stories for blind imitation. But I believe that looking around, identifying and analyzing success prospects is the right uh, trend. Israel high-tech companies with leading entrepreneurs and advanced technologies are looking to fit and adapt their products to Asian needs and culture in order to develop businesses in this continent because Israel is a small country with no significant markets for such new products. My personal recommendation is to encourage and strengthen the fertile ground for this type of cooperation between Israeli high-tech companies and local related parties such as venture capitalists, large corporates and trading companies. A perfect example of an Israeli company which must adapt and fit its products to the Asian market, which I wanted to share with you, is DID. It develops an AI-based technology to animate faces like lips, eye movements, face expressions, etc., using existing recent and or old still pictures. 
the person look, uh, the person's look life and can speak phrases and carry out live conversations with the impression and feeling that everything is life when they speaking people, uh, when they speaking people express with their own uh, dialect, their feelings and emotions as well. Everything, the movements and the speech are generated virtually based on the initial still pictures. There are many, many possible applications to this technology, like bad ones, such as generations of fake speeches of important people or opinion leaders, but also many good applications, like using old pictures of family members who passed away or parents or grandparents, for example, and carry out this um, with, uh, with them live interaction conversations which look completely realistic. Mm. This application of nostalgia is already in use of by millions of people around the world. Of course, the subjects of the conversation and of the face expression must be adapted and tailored to the local culture and the habits. Only yesterday, when we, we marked the International Family Violence Day, the Israel TV broadcast station screened a, very, a terrifying and creepy but very important video clip with live pictures of five women who were murdered by their husbands, speaking live about the circumstances when they were killed and the lessons to be learned. It was frightening, but most important. The video clip had a big echo in Israel. I'm sure that such a video clip will be prepared different, uh, in a different way for the Far East to pass a similar message. This is just an example of an Israeli company which is looking to expand its business in, China, in Asia. There are thousands of such cases and opportunities for cooperation between Israeli high-tech companies and local related parties in, China, in Asia. This vehicle can be very powerful to spreading and disseminating the Israeli entrepreneurial character and culture in Asia. Mm. Thank you. And uh, if you look in the chat, there's a link to a, a Google Doc that shows some examples of how this technology is used to animate people's, to, to animate a photo basically, so that it looks like they're speaking. And it's, it's quite amazing. There was a photo of Amelia Earhart. And uh, you can pilot. really speak interactively with this person. Yeah, yeah. So I encourage you to, to check out the link. Um, and the name of the company, Eliezer? DID. It's uh, www.d. Uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, ID. com, and that's in the in the dot com, Yes, dot com. Thank you. So, um, Eliezer says he doesn't like to talk about success stories, but I would love to hear about some stories about companies that are really sort of representing the the spirit of entrepreneurship in your region, who 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 serve as a model. Um, for for maybe challenges they've overcome or or ways of being agile. Does anyone have a, a story or an example they could share? I I can speak about some of the experiences that I had with uh, when I was a young venture capitalist investing in uh, uh, in an Israeli company that was the first company that uh, invented introduced uh, voice over IP. And uh, this was uh, this is history. This is a way that all this uh, communication today over IP developed, and everything is. Uh, we have Zoom today. We have so many advanced technologies. But I remember the first conversation of on, on over IP, which was terrible. It was terrible. But this was in the late nineties mm. of the previous century. Okay. So. Uh, these are kind of examples that uh, you you introduce a new technology and then you see the results after several years. Yeah, and then how it evolves over the years. It exactly. Evolves. Anyone else? Um, I might, uh, if I may. Uh, yes. I think um, so. Just uh, as a background, I think um, the lack of. Uh, there's a stark contrast with like Israel um, venture capital funding being like 10 billion uh, and the per capita being highest. And then uh, Japan, which is quite populous uh, per capita venture capital investing is, is nothing compared to that. It's yeah. certainly growing, but uh, it's still small. And one of the reasons is because for good or bad, it's really easy to IPO. And so um, just uh, as a comparison, 
um, th there are kind of numerous uh, startup exchanges in different parts of the world. Uh, but the one in Japan, Mothers, uh, actually is a place where you can uh, go public uh, with a as low as a 40 to 50 million market cap uh, loss making for sure. Uh, you just need a CFO who has been around for two, three years and uh, a, a board. Um, and so um, it's uh, to, to a certain extent, it's really easy uh, for founders as well as the angels or the initial set of uh, venture capitals to liquidate. Uh, and then uh, there are certainly companies that have reached the uh, kind of unicorn status after being public. Mm -hmm. uh, but then this uh, company called Mercari, which is a P2P marketplace uh, for uh, to trade used goods, they actually uh, waited until they uh, reached a $3 billion market cap before IPOing. And uh, thanks to that, uh, there was obviously... Uh, a few good effects. And one is that it produced a lot of uh, to, be, to become angel investors who have kind of uh, invested back into the ecosystem mm -hmm. uh, and to support more entrepreneurs. But also it's just the sheer image that if you actually grow your business without going public, that you, uh, you can uh, grow without having to pay the, the cost of being a public company. Uh, you can actually venture out into a few different adjacent uh, business areas to actually uh, increase your total addressable market. In their cases, they actually uh, invested a lot in foreign markets. And Europe, they, I, I think we must admit, it was a total failure. But the U.S. actually, uh, they penetrated and then uh, they, they kept on investing. And they are finally kind of seeing uh, the seeds kind of blossom. Uh, and uh, it would have been very difficult to kind of plant those seeds if they had uh, gone public at an early stage. And mm -hmm. so I think that sort of image of uh, there's actually a choice, uh, a conscious choice of not going public early uh, and then kind of um, working with VCs to remain pub uh, private and to grow your business. Uh, actually, the, mind, uh, the mindset has, um, has started to change. Uh, and I think Mercari played uh, quite a big role in that. So... I would point that as one uh, of a of a success story in Japan. Um, yeah. I completely agree with you. This is what happens in Israel exactly because uh, it's now a culture that you build a company for value, not for exit. <laughs> and this is uh, key to the success: building mm -hmm. a company totally. for value, not for exit. It makes it different. I mean, there's so much peer pressure when you see all these other startups doing things a certain way to feel like that is the the way to to succeed. So when, when a company can take a different path and show that that's viable as well, it, it's very powerful. And I think it speaks also to Sinatra's point about being more sustainable, right? That sometimes right. that IPO is not the best um, option for a company. Right. And especially if you're, if you're talking about the middle to smaller startups, right, who, you know, in, in terms of getting to the IPO level, I, I would have to say it's a lot more work. Uh, I mean, they would have to have really something special. And that um, coming across my mind in terms of some of the things that we have to deal with uh, when I, you know, one of the sessions that I was advising, advising this young uh, fellow who has at that time a five, a chain of restaurants, uh, three brands, and one of them had like five restaurants already. And, you know, he came in, you know, he came to the session asking, you know, how can I grow bigger? How can I, you know, you know put in more? And what should I do in terms of, you know, raising fundings and everything? And I just ask him, like, well, uh, how are your people? And, you know, in each of your restaurants? And he says, well, I don't know. I have a manager in each restaurant. Hmm. So I was like, well, when was the last time that you visited your restaurant? Four months ago. And I was like, so how do you measure in terms of, you know, how you're doing? You know, do you look at any customer engagement data? Do you do any, you know, simple things that to know whether your customers are satisfied or whether you know whether your people are satisfied? And, you know, that's, you know, it, it comes across one too many times for me when I meet uh, people like that. And I, you know, I, I try I try to just go back to the basics and say, like, well, you know, before you think about growth, I would really, yeah. really suggest that you strengthen your core first, you know, and what is your company you know, values. I mean, do, do you have a value company? What you're trying to do? Because at times when I think when we are all into this whole, you know, ship of entrepreneurship, we all think, you know, most of the time, a lot of people, I would say, you know, think about the money part. 
And I'm I'm really excited because in the past, you know, few years, the impact, you know, ventures have been coming up. So, you know, we, we kind of have to force ourselves to slow down and say like, well, you know, like how many more e-commerces can do we need in this, you know, marketplace? You know, how many of, you know, stuff can we buy? And we all, you know, we are all well aware of the impact of the world and everything. And I say to a lot of the companies who are not in impact, well, if you're in business as an entrepreneur, your impact is first and foremost is to your people. You know, uh, your people are the ones who are going to make your company grow. So, I mean, there are instances where, you know, that has been put to the test, you know, the challenge, you know, when a company grows, as I mentioned before, and they just, you know, they make their companies grow three times overnight just because, mm-hmm. you know, they are expected to grow. And that's the question that we all kind of have to kind of stop and say, OK, are, is it as in a Shun you know, mentioned regarding Macari, you know, is it time? Is this the right time to do that? And I think with the right strategy and the right fundamentals, uh, you will reach that level, you know, at one point. But it shouldn't be uh, something that could be pushed in just, you know, with a button. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's such a great point. That idea that you need that strong foundation to grow from. It's not just grow because you want to grow. And it also sounds like it goes back to the collectivism, really just caring about the people and the culture. I'm making right. sure that's in place first before yeah. you're all looking at the, the optics right. of, of what your growth right. is like. Right. Wow. Jane? Um, well, on our side, uh, in terms of a success, actually, I, I completely agree with the narrative. It would be nice to actually and you know have an aspect of um, of impact, I think, you know, with, with any kind of startup. Um, in Hong Kong, we have a company called Green Monday, um, who, it, it's an artist, it's not Ted, you probably know them already, been in this kind of space. They are, a, a, you know, as I suppose, an ESG and an impact kind of startup. The, the, the founders actually started many years ago in Hong Kong, just trying to encourage people to go just vegetarian one day a week, um, you know, if they can, to try and make a difference just on, on there and, and hopefully make um, more and more of a habit change um, regarding eating less meat and things like that, to the extent whereby he actually then created um, a, a plant protein kind of food. And, you know, that, that was incredibly successful. And uh, I think last year they raised, um, you know, in, in October last year, they, they raised something like 20, and 70 billion, uh, sorry, 70 million dollars and they don't have a public kind of valuation so we couldn't say that they were a unicorn but they're certainly doing very well and it looks like you know they almost did this overnight but if you actually knew the founders they have been working very very hard on that whole aspect of you know just you know reducing um, harm on the planet as much as they can and, and for the founders of that group it very much was based on trying to reduce meat consumption so the, the impact side I think is incredibly important but I think to be realistic if you look at Asia as a whole you know we have come a little bit later to the whole start game I think to more established hubs like you know you mentioned Renita um, Silicon Valley you know that is the you know the, the, the foremost I suppose in terms of just the longest mm-hmm. it's been around but like you say it started incredibly early people don't really remember like you know I, I would say a lot of the development happened in the, in the 70s and things with uh, you know these big tech firms with Stanford there encouraging and collaborating with uh, these tech firms to actually develop that that kind of like tech and mindset to the extent I think that whole VC cycle has sort of been adopted across different locations around the world by virtue of how early it started um, but also by virtue of the fact that, you know, a lot of the media in the U.S. are international media. And therefore, you know, they, they do shape public opinion, you know, really quite a lot. And I don't think people in the ecosystem appreciate the influence the media has been in terms of, you know, passing that whole VC model where you try to scale, you try to basically get funding at the beginning to, to take it, you know, to the next level, even, you know, at the, the sort of um, 
even if you haven't created the kind of profits, you know, at the cost of, of that, try to get there at all costs and it's a zero sum game kind of thing. And so therefore, I, I think sometimes we do tend to look at the success of a startup, you know, still very much through potentially the valuation, the fact that they go public as well. And, and I agree, you know, there's different stock exchanges around the world that make it easier to, to go public, um, even pre-revenue. Um, but I think it's, um, you know, it's definitely one metric. There's no getting around the fact that, you know, that is a metric that you can measure success by and it allows you to measure and compare yourself to your peers mm -hmm. around different locations around the world. But I do think if, um, you know, we had more of an impact side, it would be good. Um, you know, if that was some level of measure as well. But, you know, maybe that's just a little bit too idealistic as well. But we, I, I do think we've got some fantastic companies here in Hong Kong. Um, you know, another good story I would like to mention is Kluk. It's a travel tech company, which, you know, has been devastated, obviously, by mm -hmm. what's happened with the pandemic. And just the fact that the Kluk is a, a, basically they're a unicorn. And they basically just sold a lot of different types of park, um, travel um, experiences and products through an online platform very efficiently, um, cheaper than your average kind of um, location. So they were very successful when, of course, the pandemic hit all of that suddenly stopped but what they did was create all these like new categories of like home experiences whereby you can get chefs and you know a whole bunch of food delivered to your place if you wanted to or they basically decided to um teach a lot of the small kind of vendors that they had to go digital so these are you know these really fragmented little small players in different places in asia who never used the internet or, or used them um, internet platforms to book business you know they put these people on on the platform and, and taught them how to take advantage of that and of course they got a, a percentage of revenue for the little mm. you know, local kind of trips they did so it was all these kind of things that they they did that diversified and now with um you know and, and we know it will come when the pandemic settles down um you know you've suddenly got new um classes of revenue um that you didn't have before and frankly before covid or the pandemic um they might not even look to all of this so mm. you know you know, there is the talk about the silver linings. It really is true. And I think if you've got the right kind of founders, the opportunities are immense. Yeah. And they showed great resourcefulness finding those yeah. opportunities. Mm. Yeah. Um, well, that kind of leads me to my next question, which I'm going to give you the option to answer uh, in two ways. One is I'm, I'm curious, what do you see as the potential obstacles to growth or, or expansion in your region? Or alternatively, what do you see as the, the, the greatest opportunities that you think entrepreneurs or, or agencies or governments and any of the players in the ecosystem um, should be aware of? So, so potential obstacles to growth, risks, or, or alternatively opportunities. Anyone feel free to... Um, I, I will mean, just connect I, with... Oh, sorry. I would like to be optimistic and start, uh, start okay. with opportunity Thank here. You, the opportunity, looking from Israel, the opportunity I think is in cooperation between uh, uh, high tech Israeli companies and uh, Asian parties because it's, it will be a win win game. Everybody needs the other. Israel needs uh, support and assistance in penetrating Asian markets. Mm -hmm. Israeli companies cannot penetrate the, Israel, the Asian markets just by themselves. They need the other party to, to participate and to cooperate. On the other hand, I think that Israel can contribute not only to the economy of the other countries where its products are commercialized, but also by inseminating this culture and spirit of high-tech entrepreneurship. So it will be a win-win game. This is the opportunity, I think, in creating force multipliers between uh, uh, parties from different countries. And in this case of entrepreneurship, Israel and an Asian country. Mm. So really looking for those opportunities to collaborate and create a bigger so, party. To cooperate and the one plus one equals more than two. Mm. Always a good thing. <laughs> Sinartus, were you going to say something? Right. I mean, uh, in terms of the next phase of stages, like what uh, Jane was stating, you know, like sometimes you think this is more idealistic than anything else. Like, you know, for me, it would be like, Go would be it. great to have more impact 
uh, entrepreneurships coming on. And for example, like uh, in Indonesia right now, in terms of the solar panels, uh, you know, in terms mm -hmm. of the strategy that the government is planning, uh, it's heading the right way. Uh, however, there are certain stumbling blocks just because the government wanted to do certain things like 70, if I'm not mistaken, 70% of the parts of the solar panel project has to be from Indonesia, has to be manufactured in Indonesia. And that create a bit of a, you know, a hurdle. And, you know, there are reasons why the government's probably wanted, you know, wanted to do that. But I would say that this is also an opportunity where the younger generations uh, are more aware of, you know, the impact of, you know, what global warming is doing, and et cetera. And with the whole, you know, issue, uh, with the whole stance of platforms or social network, uh, you know, if, if an entrepreneur actually plays its cards right, you know, laid out its strategy correctly and, you know, have a call to action and learn, you know, from, you know, some of my uh, favorite companies that I follow uh, are uh, companies like Patagonia and mm. learn how you know, they actually made an impact that's positive. And I love seeing startups that have, you know, the... Uh, uh, the, the trades of Patagonia, the, the B Corp uh, trades, you know, and those are a lot of those companies, I think, are really setting up the standards to a lot of the youngsters. You know, like these are, you know, it, it's more than just IPOing. It's more than, you know, making it into, you know, exiting. Mm -hmm. You know, it will be great if we can go into a lot of entrepreneur uh, events and not have anyone ask people, you know, what's your exit strategy? Because, you know, sometimes there is, you know, like I think for a lot of these entrepreneurs, you know, un unless you are really backed by people who, you know, have a time frame, you know, like the exit strategy is actually producing something that is sustainable. Uh, and, you know, that I think uh, would have to be uh, asked in a different way, you know, in terms of their success story. Wouldn't that be great if that became the question? <laughs> right. Sustainable instead of how much have you raised? You know, right. what, what's your exit plan? Yeah. yeah. Shin? Um, oh, sorry. Oh, Jane? Sorry? No, Shin, go, Shin, you go ahead. Shin, you go ahead. Okay. Um, very quickly. Um, I, I think so for Japan, the obstacles are actually the opportunities. And for um, there's uh, so it's, it's like demographic, it's an obstacle, uh, low productivity, a lot of analog, low digitalization, that's also an obstacle, high insurance costs mm -hmm. because of the demography, those are all obstacles. But um, there's actually, uh, you know, fl the flip side of the coin is that those are opportunities that are not really addressed well by the large corporates, uh, mm -hmm. which is why I think um, digitalization, there's a lot of uh, opportunity for B2B SaaS uh, in order to, you know, stop the rubber stamping, uh, just do Zoom, uh, stop trying to commute, um, you know, two and a half hours on, uh, right. on the train one way. Uh, and UiPath, when we looked at the S1, I think when they went IPO, uh, about 20%, a little bit less of their revenue came from Japan. So oh, no. you know, large markets slightly um, finally waking up to digitalization. Same thing with health tech. Uh, I think personalized medicine, uh, how to use data, uh, but also with the kind of uh, um, also consideration that you know data management is now really a geopolitical issue. Uh, and um, so... Uh, there, there needs to be kind of strong policy, but once that policy is set, then I think it's, there's a lot of uh, room for uh, deep tech, health tech startups to actually provide um, good solutions uh, to in the health tech sector. Uh, and so I think um, the, those kind of obstacles uh, of growth are actually uh, a lot of uh, bring a lot of opportunities to startup to to actually build strong businesses. That's that's yeah. my take. They could flip very quickly, couldn't they? from one side to the other. Um, Jane? So, um, you know, I think that the, the biggest obstacle for us here in Hong Kong, and I'm sure it's also one of the major issues in other startup hubs around the world as well, is, is lack of talent, is tech talent, you know, and I everyone who is trying to build an ecosystem, you know, is, is always talking about the fact that they never have enough people who's experienced in AI and all these kind of like um, coding experience, even marketing, operational. Um, so that for us is an issue because of two major factors. I mean, we do have five universities in Hong Kong that are within the QS100 ranking. It's at a very high percentage. In fact, I think we're the only city with five universities in that, which means that we actually produce a lot of very, very good, talented um, graduates, technical graduates as well. But we also have a very, very vibrant kind of um, financial services industry, consulting firms industry, 
and they basically suck up a lot of the, the talent. You know, why would you go and find a new startup when you can work for mm -hmm. one of the best banks and, and get all the port perks, the status that come with that? So we're always battling against something like that as well. And also, um, I think culturally as well, I mean, it's great to hear Shun saying that in Japan, you know, some of the youth now see joining startups as something that they want to do. We haven't reached that kind of stage yet. I mean, we were getting there, but, you know, even though the students actually want to join startups, I think, um, you know, there's always the, the parents kind of feel who want their kids to be working in much more stable jobs and everyone is smiling because they know that's exactly the case in the locations too so finding like they're fighting the battles amongst like that that kind of the parents kind of mindset so for us that's partly one issue the other issue is also we're finding that of course um to be a successful startup oftentimes you're talking about um cross-border you're talking about you know scaling globally and that kind of um, depend depending on your industry, that scaling globally um, is not as easy as they say. Just because you've got a digital offering doesn't mean to say it's mm -hmm. easy. So if you're working in regulated um, industries like financial services, fintech, um, health tech to a certain extent, and a lot of these other kind of industries, the regulations play such a big part in what you can and can't do that you know, just trying to even, you know, you've really got to make a decision as to which market you want to enter because even trying to address that specific location's regulations, it's going to suck up so much of your time and resources. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, you know, you, you do have to take that into account. So whilst everything is globalizing, um, that in itself throws up, you know, a lot of um, a lot of operational headaches, actually, which aren't easy to, to overcome. And then, of course, when you add in, you know, something like fintech, you've got all the compliance rules as well. It's it's, it's very difficult. Um, in terms of opportunities, though, I mean, here in Hong Kong, we're finally seeing a lot of the developers and people within the property industry, you know, really starting to jump on, jump in with both feet in terms of tech um, across a whole different areas, whether operating, improving operational costs, whether we're talking about, you know, reaching their, their um, customers in, a, in better and easier ways, um, all these kind of things that add value, construction tech, all these kind of things, the whole prop tech space is, is really taken off here. And, um, you know, of course, it's something we're also seeing a lot in, in Asia is that whole crypto kind of space as well. You know, that crypto is, is you know, really, really hot. And I think with things like the NFT side of things, mm. uh, the tokenization side, of course, a blockchain has always been in the background, but now we're starting to see that being deployed in, you know, in so many different kind of ways i think um that nft you know the, the froth aside um I, I think there's some incredibly fundamental things that's happening in this kind of space and um i liken it almost to um you know to the beginnings of the internet you know during that whole like um what was this what is this it's all people trying all these different things and then you yeah. find out what you you can and can't do with that specific bandwidth i think we're starting to see something like that within the whole crypto nft blockchain space and I, I can't wait to see how it all evolves actually mm, i can't either that's, that's yeah just to say the last word i will i will invite everybody of you to come to israel and pull israeli companies it has to be a proactive pull process israeli companies will not come by themselves they have to be pulled to ah. the, uh, the places where the market is and then it will be beneficial to all the parties here. Well, maybe you can be the gateway for that. The I, liaison. Yeah, well, everybody is welcome here. I have many red carpets here for everybody. <laughs> well, I'm I'm getting a very generally optimistic picture of of Asian markets, which is very exciting. It's, it's mm -hmm. simply a matter of seeing those potential obstacles and how they could be opportunities. Finding the partners to collaborate with, how to create a bigger pie. Um, so I really appreciate all of your your, your thoughtful perspectives and uh, taking the time to, to join us on the panel. So thanks to all of you, and I look forward to being in touch. Go yeah, on. you just tell me when you come to Israel, when you land, the rest is on me. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Renita, and everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.